Hi everyone, my name is Aurelia and I'm Head of Marketing at London Trade Art. Welcome to the first episode of our webinar series on art and well-being at work. These have been very challenging times for everyone across the world, as we've had to rapidly adjust to not only the natural fears and uncertainties that come with the outbreak of a pandemic, but also unprecedented changes in the way we work and live. In the three months of September, redundancies in the UK reached a record high of 314,000. And by the 18th of October, 9.6 million jobs were reported to have been furloughed. At the height of the lockdown, it has been reported that approximately 60% of the UK's adult population were working from home. 39% of those remote workers reported feeling, feelings of loneliness and 22% reported that they have more trouble switching off after work often working longer hours. With such drastic changes, it is unsurprising that mental distress was estimated to be 8.1% higher in April 2020 than it was between 2017 and 2019. So how, especially during these lockdowns, can we help to alleviate some of those mental health issues, such as negative thinking, depressed thoughts, and stress that we are all experiencing during these challenging times? In today's episode, we will be discussing how art can impact mental health, especially in the context of the pandemic and when working from home. Speaking today are Georgina Bale, CEO of tech recruitment agency, Bauer Talent, Francesca Casaraghi, CEO of London Trade Art, and Sue Hamilton White, art therapy expert and founder of the social enterprise, Untapped. If you have any questions for our speakers, please add them to the chat and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end. First up, I'd like to start with Georgina, who will give us an overview of smart working and its strengths, its weaknesses, and its effects on mental health. Thank you, Aurelia. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, hosting this webinar with you, Aurelia, and Francesca, and Sue. Um, London Trade Art are an amazing organization, and um, I'm really excited to hear what Sue, Sue has to say on the art therapy side, too. Um, before we get to that more important element of the webinar, I'd just like to set the scene a little bit around smart working and give you a little bit of insight into what I've seen as um, a recruiter in the last nine months and the impact that I've seen that have on individuals and teams and businesses as well. Um, I'm very, very conscious, um, given what I do, about the, the number of unemployed uh, people out there that I speak to every day um, and they obviously have their own stresses and strains around job searching at home and and, um, and and the fear of the future that that holds and I really believe that this webinar is going to really help um, help those individuals as much as those who are stuck working at home trying to balance a new routine. Um, so I'd like to just, um, I'll, I'll talk for just 10 minutes or so and set the scene here from my perspective. Um, Bauer Talent, we, we, we have two recruitment businesses. We focus on um, support staff admin HR across all levels, all the way up to COO level and Lean Teams, which is a technology recruitment business. So that, that focuses more on women in tech and helping to build that. And most of our clients in that industry are technology, which overall has been a more buoyant industry than um, for support staff across the board. There are three things for me this year has really um, hit home on. One is virtual working product productively. So keeping that productivity high. Um, un, um, productivity is one of the key concerns of um, employers at the moment. So the employers that we work with have surveyed that productivity um, alongside mental health hit at the top two of the concerns that they have um, from this year. So it's really, uh, really important to kind of understand how the new way of working affects that and how you can refine it if you feel you need to. The third leg to those two really core elements of mental health and productivity um, for me is advancing technology. And I, I think that that is both the uh, one of the problems, but also absolutely the cure to a lot of the issues that we have around productivity in particular. So I'll talk a little bit about technology as well. Um, firstly, on productivity, as I said, that's one of the top employer concerns from this year. Um, and I think that that really is um, 
it, the overarching theme there is the technology that's being used these days for productivity. So we specialize in understanding what softwares and what working habits people have and what they use day to day. Um, and I think it's useful to understand um, the way that technology has changed and especially the way that this year has accelerated those changes. It used to be uh, that technology in business was used for, the, for all of the companies. So if there was a, technolo a technology solution across the business, then everyone generally would be rolled out to, to everybody. So think Microsoft Office, all the basics. Um, now there are layers and layers of technology. So you have um, obviously rollouts across the business, but then you have particular softwares that teams might use and then individual softwares that individuals might use for their own productivity and workflow. And understanding the chaos that, that those different softwares can cause in a team, especially when you're not talking face to face each day in an office, um, is really important to understand which are good for you, which um, are useful for you. Um, we've actually built a um, learning platform called Tech Warriors, which launches next year to address this problem. So that it will be helping uh, to help to upskill and level up individuals and teams on all of these common softwares um, in real time so that people can have access to that learning and understand how to pick up new softwares and technologies really quickly. Um, one of the trends that we've seen and one of the groups that we've seen the biggest um, impact from this year in terms of mental health are um, uh, the older generation of candidates that we see because technology um, by tradition is, is a little bit more of a gap for them and they've really struggled in the job market um, um, against the, you know, the age old discrimination discriminatory elements of, of um, wanting to pick younger candidates because of the tech ability and that is a gap that we are on a mission to close um, for those candidates so um, those individuals have really you know they, they've a lot of the time they've been in businesses for 15 20 years and now find themselves redundant and they need to, to find ways to find to compete in a market that has actually shifted beyond that which we've not seen previously this year in, in such a short space of time. Um, on from that, um, I think it's really important to understand how to work productively and how to maintain uh, either when you're job hunting or whether you're working at home, a, a good structure. Um, and for me, there's four things there that help to build productive working and to keep your remote working balanced. One is structure. So establishing and maintaining um, a daily routine. Uh, um, and it, in the beginning, it's important to be disciplined about that because it then reformats the brain and, 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 and your brain will start to adhere to that routine and it will become more natural. Um, that applies you know, to your working day, but also if you're, if you're job hunting is, is having that structure and that routine every day so that you, you get into a really nice rhythm um, and you're not stressing each day about what, what your day holds and what it's going to look like. Mindfulness is another big one, and I know that I think um, Sue and Francesca may talk about that in a bit more detail um, later, but understanding yourself and understanding when you need to take a break, um, understanding your stress levels and being kind to yourself in that, in, in that circumstance. And I think um, looking at ways to alleviate that stress, um, as we're going to look at um, art in more detail today, is really essential. Um, support and family are obvious, and maintaining those close relationships as best you can virtually. Um, and the, the balance. So finding a way to get balance in your life. And that could be work versus pleasure, but it could also be um, job hunting versus exercise, whatever that balance needs to be for you to feel like you are under control and it's um, within a good structure is really important. Um, one of the other trends this year that we've seen that I think is super important is the really the big divide between um, uh, wealth levels in candidates and wealth levels um, around mental health. And I think one of the myths I think we'll dispel today is that art is the domain of the wealthy. That's obviously not true. And I think um, the rest of my panelists will agree with me. There are many different ways that you can access art. It doesn't need to be um, something that only wealthy uh, only the wealthy have access to and I think that that's a really important element given the divide that we've seen in in rich and poor and the impact that COVID has had um, and in mental health. Um, so finally I think um, before I hand over to Sue um, I'd like to just touch on moving into the future. Um, so 
the trends that we've seen this year, good and bad, um, I think will be taken into the future. And I, I think that even when the world goes back to normal post COVID, we're going to see um, the, the virtual working is going to is going to be a new, more common thing. There are obviously upsides from that in terms of um, flexibility for individuals, especially working parents. Um, but it also brings new stresses and strains that we need to be very aware of, such as overworking when you're at home and you don't get the separation between work and home life. It's easier to, to overwork as much as it is to not be productive. Um, and being conscious of that is something that employers definitely need to think about into 2021. Um, as I said, harnessing technology is going to be huge. And um, I think we'll see an acceleration in the, the types and the styles of technology that are available for businesses to stay connected with their staff. And um, hopefully also some really amazing technologies around mental health to help to support that um, for employees and for individuals as well. And finally, efficiency. Um, there are lots of things about virtual, work, virtual working that make um, work and um, job hunting more efficient, um, but it's understanding your own workflow and your own role, um, how that how that can be improved, getting feedback from your team, getting feedback from the people that you're speaking to every day um, if you're job hunting um, and, and sort of staying connected and creating that online community that you can draw on um, inside and outside of work. Um, so I think that's hopefully setting the scene for how I see um, how I see the job market at the moment and how I see um, especially people who are job hunting and the impact that they've that they've had from this year um, and looking at how technology can can kind of both lift you out of that, um, but also be conscious of what's coming down the line next year of, of new technologies and things that can help um, to make you more efficient, but also to help with the work-life balance. So um, I'll hand over to Sue to talk a little bit more about the art therapy side. Hi, hi. Um, so I'm, I'm an art therapist. Um, I am an artist as well, um, and I'm also the managing director of an art social enterprise called Untapped. Um, and we use art to support vulnerable young people. And we do that by providing art therapy and also um, providing artist residencies. Uh, I also work in uh, as an art psychotherapist in CAMS, which is um, child and adolescent mental health services within the NHS in a hospital. So. Um, the ethos of the social enterprise that I set up, uh, gosh, it was probably in the early 90s, but we, we incorporated about 10 years ago, is that, you know, employing Boyce and Picasso's ideas that everyone is an artist. So the problem is that we, we often lose the ability to believe in the potential of our creative abilities kind of as we go through school. Um, and I've heard a lot of people say I can't draw and I you know I would be rich if I had a penny for every time I'd heard that and and I think this um, pandemic has shown us that we're, we're we have a lot more potential we can adapt creatively to this situation and using art is such a valuable way of boosting our mental health and helping us to cope I'll go into more about that so art connects with our innate desire to play and explore. It can help us to work out problems. And that's where art psychotherapy comes in. Um, so what is art psychotherapy? Uh, I'm just going to kind of explain that because that forms the basis of everything I'm going to tell you. And I, I'm quite surprised how many people are not really familiar with what it is. So it's also known as art therapy. So art psychotherapy, art therapy, they're interchangeable terms. Um, and it's the process of creating art with the guidance and support of a professional art therapist. And it's also a type of psychotherapy. So through the process of making art, clients are able to explore their inner world, develop greater self-awareness, express thoughts and feelings, access creativity and self-esteem and better cope with stress. So if I'm stressed, I'll talk about myself if I'm stressed and I just can't work out how to kind of move from that feeling to a feeling of calm getting a piece of paper out getting anything to draw with and making the kind of putting my feelings onto paper or even sculpting my feelings into a form that I can see that process is hugely beneficial um 
I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that process and how it helps us. So the opportunity to fully explore unconscious and conscious feelings using art materials in place of the pressure to communicate verbally provides a unique freedom. So in an art therapy session, you might, I might work with someone who is non-verbal completely, they cannot use words or language, or I might um, use language and non-verbal and um, my client might make art, I might make art alongside my client, but there's no pressure to, to speak. I can also work completely verbally uh, as in sort of traditional psychoanalysis, that's our training. Um, so art therapy is proven to be effective in treating depression, anxiety, trauma, bereavement, addiction, mental health diagnoses, as well as difficulties relating to learning or physical disabilities, um, neurological conditions and physical illnesses. You'll find art therapists um, working in schools, hospices, prisons, forests, war zones, refugee camps, museums, care homes, hospitals, galleries, in fact anywhere where humans gather in need of therapeutic support. And um, we train for a minimum of five years to master's level and we have to be HCPC, which is Healthcare Professions Council registered in order to practice. Um, our professional body are the British Association of Art Therapists. So we are, we are rigorously regulated. That came out right, rigorously regulated. Okay, so we, are, we have to, counsellors, for example, don't have to be regulated, but we are, yeah, they're quite strict with us, which I think is amazing and important. Um, um, so now more than ever, we are, art therapists are investigating um, different ways of utilising the incredible resources available online to assist us in our clinical work. And I'm really talking about uh, art therapy in online galleries. Art therapy in galleries and museums is a thing. It's, it's been a thing for a long time. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this in a, in a minute. Um, so since March, I'll just tell you about my experience, how my work has changed. I've had to meet all my art therapy clients online, um, not surprisingly, but apart from the young people I see as CAMs in patients in the hospital where I work. So the transition was very challenging for me at first. Um, I found myself making more art in order to process my feelings and doing a hell of a lot more gardening. And in fact, I was one of my clients who I had, I was talking to online, he and I were having sunflower competitions every week. He won, but that was part of the therapy, I guess, anyway. So anyway, I found myself, yeah, making lots of work. Some of my clients, um, the clients with learning disabilities, um, not only struggled to communicate, using like the technology but a lot of them don't have computers we take that for granted so we have to think about you know um access to technology can people use technology do they have technology you know um and when i'm working with someone online they have to be in a room where they cannot be overheard by other people in their family or interrupted by the dog or the postman or whatever, you know, so it's the week challenging for everyone. Um, so I've had to sort of find creative solutions um, to this or put um, therapy on hold completely for people. So before COVID, art therapists, we did not work online. It was kind of like not the thing we do. We have to be in the room with the client. So um, positive aspects of this pandemic is that there are creative solutions and art is the thing that will help you to find those creative solutions making things drawing things putting your feelings down writing about your feelings collecting objects that speak to you um, and that includes art or viewing art okay so everything's changed so we have to change the way we're working in order to thrive and survive so and we're also realising the value of the creative industries more than ever because we're losing them if only temporarily. Okay, so experiencing art within the therapeutic relationship, which is um, what art therapists will um, talk about as our main, the relationship between the client and the therapist is, is paramount. So this is a useful tool in self-exploration and personal meaning making. So art therapy, works with the relationship between the client, the therapist and the art object. 
and that art object can either be created by the client or ready made as in an online gallery idea. Um, so the processing, processing of trauma and other difficulties is affecting through engaging in this triangular relationship between the client, the therapist and the art. Um, the process of having your art making or your feelings about cho your chosen art object uh, witnessed by a therapist and or a group, um, we can have an online group obviously, is powerful in terms of uh, connection and validation. So we can connect to our feelings through playing creativity and it gives us the opportunity to process these difficult feelings whilst being held by the art therapist. So to give you an analogy or an example is similar to how a young child um, might have their difficult feelings held by a primary caregiver whilst learning how to deal with those feelings on their own, which is part of growing up. So the therapeutic relationship kind of um, mimics that, that early relationship and that's where healing and processing can take place using art. So um, I'd like to quote Alain de Botton and he talks about his ideal museum. So he says, you would enter the lob into the lobby and find a map showing galleries devoted to a range of topics with which we often need help, work, love, family, mortality, community, status and anxiety. In the gallery of love, for example, you might be shown Pisano's Daphne and Chloe, a deeply evocative reminder of the sense of gratitude and wonder with which most of us start relationships, but all too soon abandon. So art is a superlative memory bank for uh, precious emotions that otherwise disappear. Um, the gallery might then move us on to a Richard Long sculpture where highly irregular and dragged stones were brought into harmony within a perfect circle, a metaphor perhaps for the way our own differences might ideally be accommodated in relationships. And um, I was having a chat recently with um, a friend of mine called Jules Doyle, who um, runs the Blank Space Gallery. And she was telling me how um, they curate walls for clients. So um, they recently curated walls that were all to do with um, natural artwork. So depicting nature and how, and I, we thought together about how that might impact the viewer. And I think, you know, bringing the outside in, you know, in the winter time, especially, we can't escape to our gardens. So why not have nature on the wall? Why not, you know, have a permanent gallery in your own home? That's a totally, you know, London trade art, obviously, that's how you, do, that's how you work, but it's, it's such a valuable thing. The things that are around us, you know, how do they make us feel on a daily basis? Do they uplift us? You know, that's very important. Um, so art galleries and museums uh, can be used as a resource for psychological therapy uh, with the support and expertise of artists who are also trained clinical psychological therapists. They're safe spaces where others' lives and experiences are already on display. Places where we can reflect on and investigate our own difficulties, engaging and connecting with artworks that excite us as a normal poten enormous potential for well-being. How do you feel when you look at your favourite artwork? What makes it special for you? Personally, if I feel I can look at an artwork and see something new each time, it reminds me of my own potential to, to grow um, as a human being. Um, and that's such an important thing for me to kind of realise that I have potential and I can change this situation. If I'm feeling, you know, a lot of anxiety in a particular day, I have to, you know, in my toolkit of things that I do, I have, you know, I'll go for a run, I'll find a friend. I go through my little list, most of the things, they'll work a little bit, but if I get my sketchbook out and make a piece of art about how I'm feeling, that really does it for me. And uh, you can do that in the gallery. And you can use objects in the gallery. Um, so another example of this would be um, when we were able to visit loved ones in hospital. Um, I was always be uplifted by seeing artwork on the walls. It gives you hope for possible. It gives you. It reminds you of possibility. Um, and it's. I think it's such an important thing. 
and and on, on, in an online gallery or the art objects you may have at home, art objects are useful symbols that help us make connections with our own stories, referring to personal experiences and emotions. Think about the objects you you've collected in your home. What what um, meaning do they have for you? You know, what would you grab if your house is on fire? apart from your photo album or your mobile, you know, would you grab an object that has, you know, it's not really valuable in terms of money, but it's, it has a meaning to you, a symbolic meaning, you know. And I'll just quote um, Lisa Gray in her um, book, What Have Art Galleries Got To Do With Our Mental Health? The artwork or object is a thing outside of the individual and as such allows us to project inner thoughts and feelings onto it talking about what is personal without the fear of direct exposure that being asked directly to talk about oneself might bring, especially in a group. We can use other things rather than, we can use them as metaphors for our own feelings. Telling stories about one's life is often the basis of psychological therapies. And I believe that gallery collections can work in this way too. I really highly recommend her book. I'll just mention it again. Lisa Gray, that's L-E-I-S-A, G-R-A-Y, the surname what have art galleries got to do with our mental health? So art therapy in a gallery space or environment online uh, or in, in reality might ask the following questions. Find an art object that conveys how you're feeling today. Discuss with your group how it has affected your understanding of how you feel. And then finally, ask others to reflect on how it makes them feel. So in a typical group art therapy session, there would be a making time at the beginning and then towards the end, we'd sit in a circle or a virtual circle and discuss artwork made or objects found or artwork collected. You know, you can collect that in many ways. Um, or we, you can walk around the gallery um, so in terms of benefits, um, I want to give you an example that I heard about recently and in a conference last weekend, actually, um, the oncology department in St. Bartholomew's Hospital um, used a technique called visual thinking strategies, um, which is an educational tool um, to improve clinician abilities to diagnose illness. Uh, which dramatically improved patient care during the first wave of the pandemic. So to do this, they encouraged um, all staff uh, to take photographs of the interior of, of the incredible building. It's absolutely beautiful architecture. And this exercise enhanced their ability to observe, communicate and improve, improve their critical thinking skills. Um, so just sort of thinking about how um, VTS or visual thinking strategies could be used in an online gallery experience. So that could be in a team without an art therapist. You could enjoy art and, and share your feelings about art in a without an art therapist together. That might be a useful um, experience for you. So three questions are, are really important in VTS and they tend to kind of be, you know, the the basis of the whole process really. So the first one would be, what is going on in this picture? The second thing would be, what do you see that makes you say that? And then thirdly, it would be, what else can we find? So going back um, to the idea of uh, increasing productivity and cohesion within a staff team, this would be a useful tool, I think. Um, the staff in that hospital uh, also made art together, uh, they spread loads of plastic out in a big area and, and made clay objects together. Um, they were obviously socially distanced wearing PPE. Um, and they were, this was the process, the point of this was to help them process their feelings around working in a, you know, highly charged, highly stressful environment of a hospital during um, the first wave of the pandemic. So they were able to process and discuss the stresses they were facing uh, during to, due to COVID-19. Um, and in sharing and reflecting on their experiences, they were able to foster resilience in a compassion focused way and have different kinds of conversations with each other, apart from how are you, I'm fine, which is 
you know, are you really fine? You know, let's talk about the art you're making. Let's talk about that difficult situation. It takes you out of that stressful environment. I also run groups like this in the NHS hospital where I work. Um, and it just, everyone is lifted. Everyone it communicates on a different level on a playful childlike level. We are human. We need to connect back to our, our playful true self. That's, that's, you know, the important part of art making. Um, I'm going to finish. I think I'm maybe going over time here. Um, so in group art therapy, the group itself, the dynamics of that group mirror family and societal structures or groups. Um, so isolation can be overcome, relationships made in this sort of supported environment. Um, there's a lovely quote here from an art therapist called Bruce Moon. And he says, making art in group setting creates a sense of ritual that provides psychological safety and promotes interpersonal emotional risk taking. It also reduces isolation and creates a sense of community. And just finally, I'm just gonna finish with a quote. Uh, it is about museum uh, art therapy, group art therapy, but it, I know it applies to gallery spaces it, equally. Um, and it's from Gloucestershire NHS. Um, Holding the group in a museum was so much better and not so clinical. I could be a person, not a patient, the museum objects make you think more and surprise yourself. I hated museums before and now I love them. Okay, that's the end of my bit of talking. I hope, look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, to finish off, Francesca is going to give us some valuable insight into how we can break the working day with artistic activities and develop online team building activities with art. Thank you very much, Aurelia. And of course, uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, thank you, Georgina and Bauer Talent uh, for collaborating at this uh, uh, very important to us event. And of course, uh, thank you Sue, for uh, your precious contribution. Uh, so as our uh, previous two speakers very well said, uh, we are facing uh, unfortunate and unprecedented times uh, which are leading us to redefine our every, everyday life, uh, not only our social but also our working life. So we strongly believe that art in this context can play an important and sometimes surprising role, having the ability to reduce anxieties, as you said, uh, but also feelings of depression and improving productivity and motivation at work on the other end. So this evening, I would like to focus on the multiple possibilities which allow us to still enjoy art from our homes, starting from having physical art around, but also enjoying art through virtual tours and online viewings of museums and galleries, and finally developing online team, build team building activities through art. So for many people, this uh, second lockdown means, uh, of course, uh, to spend a lot of time at home. Above all, for those who are currently unfortunately unemployed or for those who are working from home. All of a sudden, our homes play an increased important role in our lives. Let's think about the fact that uh, the division of space is fading uh, as the places where we were used to eating, chilling, uh, playing with our children are not used also to work for many hours. Sometimes it can be very stressful. A LinkedIn survey actually proved that 40% of the workers interviewed feel more anxious and stressed than before COVID. And this situation can easily bring to the so-called working burnout. So how to still enjoy life from home? Art can be, for sure, one of the multiple solutions. In fact, it has been proven that appraising an art object as comprehensible affects positive thinking, especially in its ability to create meaning. So indeed, being surrounded by art can distract people in a positive way, boost creativity and concentration. So all the Mm, bad feelings uh, such as anxiety, mood swings, sadness and frustration, uh, which of course have bad influence also on our working productivity, can actually be relieved by having art in our homes. 
uh, the same importance of enjoying art uh, uh, during the working day has also been received by many corporates uh, during the time, uh, which invested uh, in enriching uh, the working environment uh, with high quality art, with the aim to improve the employees, uh, not only working, but also personal well being. Now, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, being an art collector doesn't mean being wealthy. Art can be accessible and affordable for any kind of spending capacities. Um, for example, by an equality um, contemporary artwork so, or a print of a renowned artwork can be affordable. Uh, most importantly, can make the difference, not only from an aesthetical point of view, but also from a psychological point of view. But if you can't afford an original artwork, you can also make your own, as Sue suggested, uh, boosting your creativity. Uh, just yesterday, a friend of mine uh, who uh, used to work in uh, the hospitality in London and uh, was currently, unfortunately, unemployed, uh, sent me a picture of uh, a painting he's creating. Uh, it was quite amazing because uh, I've spent uh, a lot of time during this year trying to convince him to come with me to an opening of an exhibition or a museum and they never wanted to join me but now that is locked down I'm very glad that he found in art an alternative way to feel busy and entertain too so it really works and a part of being surrounded by art there are also some other uh, virtual tours tools that we can exploit during these times. Since art institutions and museums are locked down too, in fact, they luckily found uh, innovative ways to st still experience the art from home, thanks to virtual tours and online viewings, which can also serve as a mental support. Some of the most famous art galleries, such as Gagosian, Hauser & Wirt, or Pace Gallery, uh, went digital even before uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, allowing people to visit their spaces uh, through virtual tours uh, on their websites. Uh, nowadays, it's a practice uh, that is available on most of the major galleries' websites. Uh, the very first uh, to launch uh, an online room uh, in 2017 was uh, David Spirner Gallery. Uh, they are now offering online viewings of several uh, live exhibitions, uh, among which one dedicated to Donald Judd that I really suggest. And they are also offering a very interesting podcast uh, in the section Dialogues. Uh, apart from online viewings, in fact, podcasts uh, can be very helpful tools, uh, not only to generate positive uh, reflections, but also to stay up to date with the latest art news uh, uh, of the art scene. Uh, among all the art podcasts, I actually selected a few of them. The first one is uh, Meet me at the museum, uh, an art fun podcast uh, where writers, TV presenters, uh, and actors uh, walk around art institutions with a companion. Uh, so, offering an alternative uh, uh, virtual afternoon out. Uh, another one is a talk art, uh, which aims uh, to uh, virtually reproduce uh, an opening private view, uh, sometimes guesting also celebrities like uh, Elton John or Tracy Emmy to discuss the relationship with art. And similarly, uh, the BBC Radio 4 podcast, Only Artists, uh, which stages uh, dialogues between uh, two artists from different fields, um, resulting in a very free flowing uh, conversation. Um, so these are some of the online viewings and podcasts that I could recommend. But there are also some organizations uh, which are developing uh, virtual reality reality and game spaces uh, to um to make the experience also interactive. Um, one example, uh, one very interesting and funny example is Occupy White Walls, uh, which is a massively multiplayer online game, which recreates a fantastical art gallery. So players are able to create their own space and fill their walls uh, with the recommended artworks, uh, thanks to a technology uh, based on the system Art Discovery AI. And uh, it's 
it's free to play, so it's really worth to try it. Uh, another platform is called Acute Art, um, and um, this brings together uh, international renowned artists such as Christo or uh, Olafur Eliasson, um, collaborating with them to the production of uh, works in VR or augmented reality or mixed reality. Um, so enabling uh, uh, users to uh, immerse themselves into a very interactive uh, environment uh, through the use of this app that has already been downloaded by millions. So it's very popular. But probably uh, the greatest platform which allows to enjoy art on different level, levels is Google Arts and Culture, uh, where users can choose among multiple experiences, such as visiting the biggest museums of the world, or discovering more about their favorite masterpieces, or moreover, experiencing innovative arts leaning VR projects. Uh, this has included uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts uh, award-winning video series uh, called the uh, Met 360 Project, uh, which invited users to go around the Met spaces uh, thanks to the use of a spherical 360 degree technology. Um, also, during the pandemic, uh, uh, Google Arts and Culture has partnered with over 500 uh, uh, global art institutions to open their virtual doors to the public so that users are able to visit uh, the British Museum in London and in a matter of seconds, the uh, Getty Museum in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, again, through the use of uh, um, an innovative technology, which is the same used for the street view uh, future in uh, Google Maps. Um, uh, so these are some of the platforms um, that uh, make uh, interactive uh, uh, the art experience. Um, on the other end, uh, there are the maybe one of the biggest art players that were forced to go digital this year, and they are the art fairs. Uh, the first one was Art Basel Hong Kong, uh, which back in March uh, launched the Art Basel or online viewing rooms, uh, which actually proved to be uh, very popular as the website uh, literally crashed. And then there was a Freeze London, Freeze Master um, uh, online viewing rooms uh, back in, uh, uh, in October. And maybe uh, one of the most remarkable example of uh, online art fairs uh, is Artissima. It's uh, Italy's most important contemporary art fair, which usually take place at uh, the beginning of November in Turin. Artissima this year combine a mixed physical and digital format, uh, proposing an unusual uh, cross-media platform covering the creative sections called Artissima XYZ, um, accompanied by uh, also free physical exhibitions uh, dislocated in some of the most renowned art institutions in, in Turin. And um, the upcoming art fairs uh, will be uh, increasingly increasingly more uh, conversational for visitors uh, with uh, uh, video, live chat, uh, and many other uh, um, online collateral uh, events. We are all waiting for the, uh, the most awaited event, uh, uh, which will be Art Basel Miami, uh, which will be held in, in December. They already announced that uh, uh, the, the art fair will be in the online format. Uh, but the funny fact, I think, is that uh, um, Art Basel Hong Kong uh, was the first one to go digital, as I said, but uh, it just announced that it, it will be the first one to go back to physical in uh, May tw uh, 2021. Um, this means, I think, uh, that uh, uh, for sure online viewing rooms uh, can have a great success, but uh, we can't deny that uh, nothing can substitute the feeling of physically being in front of an artwork and enjoy it at the fullest. On the other end, uh, as an um, insider of the art market, uh, I have to say and, and admit uh, that this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, situation actually brought uh, the art market to uh, start, uh, finally, I would say, uh, to start to fill the, te the technological gap, uh, which was uh, forcing it uh, to lag behind many other industries. Uh, so if we want to find uh, a bright side of this condition, in fact, 
is that visual arts are finally more accessible. Um, so that uh, all those uh, who you know, wouldn't uh, uh, visit physically an art fair, a museum or, uh, or a gallery, uh, now um, have at disposal um, many other innovative and alternative channels to do that. And uh, finally, to conclude, I like just to get in, in the shoes of uh, a corporate just for two minutes. And uh, because I would like to add that art can also function as a great tool uh, to enhance team building. Um, in particular, now that corporates are struggling to keep the teams unified and aligned, I think that art can contribute as a sympathetic instrument to connect people. Um, a close friend of mine works at Zalando in, in Berlin, and uh, she told me she occasionally took part in uh, art activities at the office as part of the program Art Night that I then discovered that is available also so in London, um, which in that occasion uh, invited employees to uh, create their own artwork uh, with the support of a local artist. Um, I think that this important uh, art initiatives should be moved also online because they are precious to make employees feel more bonded and to improve relationships and uh, the, to improve the feeling of being part of a community. Uh, also evaluating more the employees sense of belonging to the company. Uh, so other activities uh, can be in the form, for example, of artist talks, like the ones promoted by Deutsche Bank, or setting up democratic art committees, or supporting any artistic talent within the team. For sure, one very effective art initiative could be uh, virtual team museum or gallery tours, or even virtual tours of the offices, uh, possibly with the support of an art expert uh, um, able to explain the importance, uh, meaning, and characteristics uh, of the art hung at the offices' walls. But I don't want to talk too in detail of this aspect because it will be the core of our upcoming webinar about art at the office. Uh, so having gone through all the physical and digital art initiatives that you can exploit from your home. Uh, my only two cents suggestion is uh, whatever is the way that you want to experience art, uh, I would invite you to do that because art has the power to bring you to an alternative dimension, as uh, Sue will say, uh, to enlighten your day and to make you feel relaxed. So it will benefit your mental and also your working well being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, and thank you, Georgina and Sue, for your valuable insight. Um, I'd like to open the floor up now to questions from um, the audience. Please um, enter your questions in the chat, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So I'll start off with one for um, Sue. What practices of art therapy can people who are mentally struggling with um, mental illness at home, what can they um, incorporate in their daily routines currently? Um, first of all, I'd kind of, um, try to create boundaries in your day and a structure, uh, a bit like, uh, the first speaker talked about, try and separate your work and your leisure spaces in your home, but in a creative way, a making way, um, it would be really valuable to create a journal, an art journal. So you can, you know, just a page a day, this is how I'm feeling and go through each page, over, you know, um, there's a really beautiful book, which I'll put in the chat um, by an artist called Tom Phillips. So he got a, an existing book, which is a Victorian novel, and he made art over all the pages and changed the meaning of the book. But I've, I've done something similar. So I was going through a very difficult time after I'd been attacked working in a school. And I, I, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I had sort of PTSD. I couldn't, I struggled with lots of different things. And doing this day by day art journal, this is how I'm feeling today, going through page by page really, really helps. And I knew that by the time I got even halfway through that book, or even at the end, I will have gone through a journey processing those difficult feelings. Um, 
that might not be enough you might need to see an actual psychotherapist but making art about it express your feelings and if you if you're going to go through a process you can see how far you've come that really helps i hope that answers your question Thank you so much, Sue. So we have one for um, Georgina. What other technologies do you see coming down the line for better home working? Um, it's kind of a hard one to answer because there are so many and it, it really depends on what you're doing all day and what, what your focus is at work. Um, we're seeing a lot more collaboration tools as you might expect. Um, obviously, um, I think most people will know Microsoft Teams and Slack as sort of instant communication tools, which are very, very important tools for the future of work. Um, the idea of those tools, if you don't already use them, is that, that it takes away your email volume and it makes your, your communications more streamlined into projects, um, which is really helpful for um, visibility. Um, so in Slack, for example, you can, you can be tagged in conversations, which means that you don't have to see everything that's going on, but you can also be involved in everything that's going on if you choose to. Um, other collaboration tools are tools like Miro, which is a virtual whiteboard. Um, so you can actually uh, design and, and write um, as if it is an actual a whiteboard and you can see everybody else moving on that board so you can collaborate together so that's a fantastic tool for that um the the, the elements that, that's important for these tools it's usually a free version of all of these tools which is really helpful and then there's always a paid business version as you as you get more into it and you use it more um but we have something close to, to 1000 1500 different tools in our list so there's a lot and i think that in the next six months there'll be a boom in them as well um and actually the technology platform that we're building, we're hoping to make sure that we're bringing those through so that people can, can find them useful. Um, I think um, anything, um, th there's now lots of more groups on LinkedIn and chat groups that um, build in Slack to that so that you can create a, a Slack community um, that isn't necessarily just a work Slack, it's a, it's a forum and a communication Slack. And, and I think those are really worth looking out for depending on what niche it is that, that you're interested in. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so this one is for Francesca. Um, given many employees, especially junior ones across the UK and internationally are working from shared flats and smaller, more crowded makeshift home office spaces, um, for example, shared living rooms, how can they surround themselves with art on a daily basis without, without having their own space, so to speak, and limited budgets? Yes, of course, uh, this is a challenge that uh, uh, is involving many of us. And uh, it uh, also um, involves the, the thing that I was saying about the uh, fading of, uh, of spaces and sometimes, sometimes also privacy uh, can be uh, put on risk. Uh, but uh, what uh, I, I would suggest is to uh, make art a collective activity. Art can really have, as a say that the power uh, to connect people and can be um, for sure a, an activity to uh, to share and um, also uh, what I would suggest is as I said being surrounded by by heart can really um, uh, feel make you feel relieved and hopefully less alone uh, and if you can't afford uh, buy any art uh, apart from making your own um, I would suggest also to co collectively uh, buy a piece of art that you really like uh, with the format that, that we call fractional ownership because uh, in this way uh, art can be uh, affordable to to anyone and another fact Another thing that I would like to add is also the fact that uh, um there is not a, a right or a wrong choice when, when you buy art. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, you really liked uh, what, what you buy from an aesthetical point of view and from a psychological point of view that uh, it makes you feel uh, good. Great. Um, and then I have one for Georgina. So how do you see work from home post pandemic? How is it going to change employment from your point of view? Um, 
so I, I obviously see it, I see it becoming more normal. It already is more normal. And I think that's going to continue even when people go back to offices. Um, I think that there are loads of positives that come from it as people adjust to this big change. I think people are still adjusting and obviously they've had to cope with adjustments, not just in home working, but in childcare and in, in losing jobs or, or finding new jobs. Um, so there's been a huge amount of change that people have had to go through very, very quickly, which is stressful, even when it's good change, when it's bad change, that's even more, um, more traumatic. Um, but I think as people do adjust and it becomes more, more normal, people will hopefully um, be able to adjust their own personal working to more what suits them and I think employers are definitely geared up to make sure that they're supporting individuals in that they some already were really well um but most now will for sure be doing that um I think there are loads of I think everyone will benefit from that to some extent um I'm particularly pleased about the impact it will have on leveling out opportunities for working parents because as a recruiter we really saw a lot of um um an intentional, mostly discrimination around working parents, especially of particular age groups in having that flexibility. And I think now that that's normal, that's one of the big benefits that will come. So I think it's definitely here to stay. And I think that on the back of that, um, you know, re relaxation and leisure activities online with teams and using art as therapy um, or any other type of therapy as a team will become more normal. Um, and I think that's a really, really good thing. I don't think you need to be in a bad place mentally for it to be massively beneficial. Um, as Sue and Francesca alluded to, it's, it's also hugely beneficial for boosting productivity. I, all, I know that um, Google use um, clay modeling in teams to, to boost creativity um, as much as productivity. So, and I think they were doing that before the pandemic. So it, it's definitely, um, that that's really big benefit. Great. No, that's that's a good point. Um, and then for Sue, um, do you expect to see an increase in people turning to art therapy after the pandemic? What mental health issues do you expect people to be seeking help with? And what tools will you use to provide relief? Okay, I'm just going to get this question. Oh, the question's not on the chat. Okay, I'll, I'll try and remember that. It seems like a three part question. Um, before the pandemic, art therapists weren't really working online. And we've all had to do a lot of training to be able to deliver art therapy online. So there's more, people are needing therapy more, they need something they can access more. So I think, yes, more people will be using art therapy. We're just, we're around, which is great. Uh, and we have adapted because we were sort of stuck in little rooms and thinking, oh, this is a nice safe little room, but no, no, we're, we're out there. So yes. Um, what was the second part? Sorry. Sorry, it was um, what tools will you be using to provide relief? OK, um, well, that is a broad question and hard to answer. Tools. Uh, well, I'm not really sure how to answer that because I, I in an, art, in an art therapy encounter, I my main focus is to create a space that is safe for my clients to be able to express themselves um, however they want. And that's, and we will use art materials, we will use words, we will, you know, um, you know, I, some of my colleagues are doing online art therapy in forests, for example. So we are, we are, very, very sort of diverse in our delivery. I hope that answers that part. And then the, set, the, th the final part of that question was, sorry. Oh, that was based on the question. And what mental health issues do you expect people to be seeking help with? Okay, there's a lot of anxiety. I'm seeing a lot of anxiety about fear about what's gonna happen, as opposed to depression being about um, worries about what already has happened. Existential anxiety, which is, um, Am I going to have a job? Will I, you know, how am I going to be able to take exams, which is a current one in my household? Ooh, you know, young people, I work mainly with young people and they're fearing for their futures on so many levels. Um, and also, you know, unemployment is a massive thing, but also, uh, you know, we, we provide um, art therapy as a social enterprise to, um, people for free and mainly young people in schools for free so that you know uh 
that's a really important thing. We've got a youth suicide prevention project that we're fundraising for at the moment. So young people, we're finding a lot of anxiety, a lot of existential anxiety. Um, isolation is massive. Um, people are struggling with the lack of connection in general. Um, depression, alcoholism is a big one. Um, and dealing with frustration and, and also anger management. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I think, I think I've answered that question, hopefully. Thank you, Sue. Um, so, right. so just one last one, um, because I realize we're going a little bit over. So um, for Francesca, what programs can London Trade Art offer during this challenging period when physical art shows have been forced to close to employees looking to remain in touch with the art world? Thank you. Yes, of course, uh, um, we are trying to uh, provide a, a diversified ways to uh, sustain uh, and support uh, the, the art scene and to um, get a, a Award, to spread awareness uh, about uh, the, um, the art industry today. So uh, we are now supporting art initiatives also on our social media, like our call for emerging artists um, to get them more, more visibility on, uh, on our channels too, and supporting also uh, art therapy initiatives like the uh, SUS ones uh, and charitable uh, uh, initiatives too. Uh, apart from that, uh, we are planning to organize other uh, webinars, uh, um, again, to spread awareness of how can art uh, be of support uh, nowadays. And uh, um, we are also planning to uh, organize a, a virtual tour at our office in, uh, uh, in London. And uh, yes, I, I can read also uh, another uh, upcoming uh, question. Um, we are uh, also think uh, of uh, creating a podcast. Um, Yes, about uh, uh, yes, the art news, uh, art market, but also these uh, uh, important uh, uh, ways to, to support art. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our speakers and thank you to everyone who has tuned in today. Um, it was a real pleasure um, having someone, so many people join and to be able to discuss this very relevant and important topic. Um, and please stay tuned for our next episode of our series, which will be how art can boost motivation and productivity at the office. So we will be um, letting you know when that will happen, when that will take place. Thank you everyone and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.